On today's episode, it's the end of the line for the 747, e-commerce invades the EV space in China, and the Biden administration infrastructure plans focus on the environment. Today's episode is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.tv today. After half a century, the most iconic program in aerospace engineering history is drawing to a close. Atlas Air Worldwide has ordered four Boeing 747-8 freighters for delivery through October 2022, representing the last 747s to be built in the program. The first of the jumbo jets, the 747 program began in 1965 based on a request from Pan Am to build a larger, more capable jet than the 707s then in service. Boeing's program manager was Malcolm Stamper with the legendary Joe Sutter leading the design team. Everything about the program was unprecedented in size, from the Pratt & Whitney JT-90 turbofans to the custom-built Boeing Everett Washington plant, the largest building in the world by volume. The first flight was in 1969 with revenue service beginning in 1970. 1,600 airframes will have been delivered when Atlas accepts their last freighter, and the aircraft has served in multiple roles, from transporting presidents and carrying airborne lasers, to creating an entirely new market for low-cost transcontinental passenger travel. And the overall program cost? Well, in today's dollars, about $7.5 billion. While that seems cheap today, in 1966 it represented a risk that forced Boeing to bet the company on the success of the 747. When the program closes, the 747-8 freighter will still be the biggest heavy-lift new-build cargo aircraft in the world, with a payload of 138 metric tons. The next biggest is the aircraft that led to the demise of the 747 program, the 777, whose freighter variant can carry 102 metric tons. Cargo operators enjoy the economics of twin-jet platforms, but for outsized cargo, that big nose-loading door will surely be missed. With the success of Tesla and the rapid introduction of competing electric vehicles from mainstream auto manufacturers, it looks like there's new competition coming from an unlikely source, e-commerce. Chinese heavyweight Alibaba Group is launching a new electric sedan with wireless charging under a new brand called IM, meaning Intelligence in Motion. The project is a joint venture between Alibaba, state-owned automaker SAIC Motor, and Shanghai Jiangjiang High Tech Park Development, an investment arm of the city government. Now, Nikkei Asia reports that Alibaba, already a significant investor in Chinese EV startup Xpeng Motors, is making the move to take advantage of recent share price strength in both Tesla and Chinese domestic electric vehicle rivals. The new product launches with a significant technology portfolio. Solid-state batteries from CATL, NVIDIA chips, and a software suite that will include self-parking and smartphone functions such as picture-taking and social media sharing. Now, in a similar move to enter strategic alliances early, Taiwanese iPhone maker Foxconn Technology Group has announced a joint venture with Zhejiang Geely Holding Group, China's largest privately owned auto conglomerate. Now, Apple is also rumored to be courting established automakers for an EV tie-up. Why marry these seemingly unrelated industries? Well, industry analysts predict that the value proposition in the auto industry in the next decades will be based on battery technology and software, not traditional metrics like manufacturing capability and product brand identity. As the race to full self-driving continues, analysts in the technology space predict either fewer shared driverless pods replacing automobiles, or cars as low-cost hardware platforms for software-as-a-service offerings that entertain passengers during transport. Where do current automakers fit in this program? With no single winner yet apparent in the race to SAE Level 5 self-driving, no one knows. But the first to market, and the first to achieve US federal regulatory approval, will have a huge marketing advantage. We'll keep you posted. President-elect Joe Biden is days away from inauguration, and clean energy and infrastructure companies are enjoying notable gains on Wall Street in anticipation of the new administration's programs. Now, Biden plans to re-enter the Paris Climate Agreement, reversing the Trump administration withdrawal on November the 4th. The cornerstone of the agreement is the pledge to keep global average temperatures at no more than 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. Now, to achieve this goal, a drastic reduction in fossil fuel use will be necessary, and this is widely expected to require a combination of incentives and penalties to alter American consumer behavior. Now, incentives for the purchase of electric vehicles, well, they're already well established, but many environmentalists are demanding a carbon tax to disincentivize gasoline and diesel fuel use. According to a report in the Harvard Law Review, multiple carbon tax bills have been tabled in Congress pre-election, with carbon pricing ranging from $15 to $52 per metric ton of CO2. These taxes would rise over time. 
Now, while the Biden administration has expressed a preference for clean energy infrastructure spending and incentives rather than carbon taxes, many economists believe that low fossil fuel prices are here to stay, and the current CO2 targets simply cannot be met by just the carrot. The stick will also be necessary. According to the report, the advantage that overseas manufacturers would enjoy through operating in jurisdictions with little or no environmental regulation, well, that would be addressed by import taxes designed to level the playing field. How these tariffs could be structured to account for the energy cost component of value-added import products is unknown, as is the ability of major clean energy suppliers and auto manufacturers to scale production at rates fast enough to achieve targets. As early as summer 2019, the Trump administration identified battery metals as key strategic materials and directed the U.S. Department of the Interior to locate domestic supplies of 35 critical substances, including lithium and cobalt. The expected slowing of demand growth due to COVID-19 has brought the global mining industry time. And while lithium supplies are stable, cobalt supplies may yet limit electric vehicle production. On the grid-scale energy side, current solar or wind plus storage solutions place similar demands on battery materials, so the Biden administration's strategy is expected to include accelerated government funding for research into alternatives such as pumped hydro, gravitational, and flow battery storage. There's a lot of engineering yet to be done. This episode was brought to you by engineering.com. If you like this show, be sure to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification button for our next episode. For deeper engineering content, visit engineering.tv for exclusive shows not found in our YouTube channel. Thanks for watching.